We are on week two of a series we're calling Principles of Purpose. And last week, we kind of kicked this thing off by highlighting a character in the Bible. Um, his name was Noah, and Noah's famous for building an ark, as you may have heard. And a lot of people talk about, man, Noah, he's the guy. Look at him. Yeah, he built a boat with no electricity. That seems like a pretty good feat to me, like no electricity. And he built a 510-foot long boat. Pretty good dude. Um, uh, probably pretty handy with carpentry skills. Also, um, look at Noah. He's this great man of faith. God told him to build a boat, and he said, all right, I'll build a boat. And that's all it took. God said, do it, and he did it. So a couple things that kind of shine is, man, he's a good carpenter. Man, he's a great man of faith. And last week, we actually used some scripture out of Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, to highlight that actually, although Noah is famous for those two things, Noah was actually extremely purposeful. Noah was one of the most purposeful men in the Bible. We grabbed Genesis 6, 9. We worked with it for a little bit. We found out that why Noah was able to fulfill purpose for these three little things. One is he had the right stance towards God. Um, scripture tells us that he was a blameless man. We dug a little bit and found out that didn't mean he was blameless in his behavior. It meant he was blameless in his convictions. He had the right stance towards God. He had some convictions that he allowed to lead and guide his life. Lastly, it told us that Noah walked with God. Those three things help Noah fulfill his purpose, get his vertical life right. And this morning, we're actually going to talk about it this way, which in my opinion is a whole lot harder. And what I mean by that is how many people in here can imagine the hecklers that were present in Noah's life when he said, I'm about to build a 500 foot boat and I'm about to build it for rain that has never fell from heaven before. Back then, those hecklers are a little bit more brave than the ones maybe you encounter. They could not use a keyboard to talk trash. They actually had to come to you and talk trash to your face, um, which is it's a strange thought. It's actually rare to feel like um, you would actually have to let someone know to their face what you didn't like about them. That's what was happening in Noah's time. Can you imagine how his kids got punked in school? Oh, your daddy's the crazy guy and everything. And then all of a sudden it starts raining and they're like, oh, hang on. Wait, wait, actually, your daddy's not so crazy. Um, your daddy is purposeful. And this morning, I want to talk about real briefly about the role that people play in our purpose. God, in his wisdom, has tied people to our purpose. And to be transparent with you, um, if I could fulfill the call and plan of God for my life, just me and him, I would be good with that. Like if I could pray, I could study, I could read, I could worship, and I could have my time with God. It's not that I don't love people, but if you don't know, it's not people kind of complicate things. Like they make easy things harder. Um, did you know that? They do. They make easy things harder. And somehow, for some reason that hopefully we'll be able to find out today, God has tied people to our purpose, not just our purpose the church as a whole, not just our purpose as humanity, but our purpose as an individual. God has tied people to your purpose. And there is a story in the Bible, it's called a parable, and all a parable is, is it's a story that can have different applications, like it can mean a lot of different things. And the reason you can pull that off is because Jesus was that good of a teacher. He was, he was that good at what he did. He could say something, and you're like, man, that could mean this, 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 or this. And the story is about a guy who's working in the field, and he's working for his master, and he's working for his master, and he's trying to get some change. He's trying to get some money, because that's what we go to work for, to get some money. And there's another guy that comes in a week later, and he goes to work. And when it comes payday, the master paid him both the same amount of money. And this guy felt probably like maybe me or you would feel. They'd be like, why? How come he got paid the same amount? And uh, the parable is actually talking about heaven. I mean, no matter at what time do you come to work for the master, you still get the same reward no matter at what point in your life that you start serving him. But it also, for today, in the context today, it's also kind of out of a man who was entitled, and you've got a man that was grateful. You've got a person that was entitled, and you've got a person that was grateful, one who served people and one who used people actually to his own advantage. And you may not know this either, but today's culture doesn't put a lot of clout on serving people. It's all kind of about, let me get mine. Let me do what I need to do to advance myself, my agenda, my goals. And if I leave a cloud of dust behind me and there are lives and people behind me that I had to walk through, step on, use, abuse, and manipulate to get where I wanted to get, that's what culture preaches, but actually Jesus preaches something different, and what he preaches is, is that people are to be valued, and they're to be served, but serving, it's just not the shiny thing, and, and even in myself, to be transparent with you, serving doesn't bring a lot of notoriety, and as human beings, we've got this default in us to want to be seen, and if you're honestly yourself, there may be some things that you did right now in hopes that someone would notice. Maybe, maybe you fixed your hair for the first time, and your wife is just now noticing. I'm not for sure, but there may be some things that you did in order to get get some notoriety or to be noticed. And that's just what humans do, you know, and that's kind of our default sometimes. 
And God has come in our life to not be like, shame on you, but to reset the clock. Like we did last night, I guess. I didn't see that one coming. But anyways, to, 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 to reset the clock, if you will, in order for us to begin to notice that actually serving is what our purpose is. Serving people. And if you're anything like me, you had some good responses to serving people, and you may have some bad ones. And my goal today is hopefully for you to give God access to your life and to your experiences so that not only can he use the good times to help you fulfill your purpose, but you will actually open the door, maybe even for the first time, and allow him to use the time that were unfortunate, the things that he didn't cause, the things that he didn't have a role in, but say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with these two and find out that God uses both to help us to fulfill our purpose. And when it comes to serving people... You may know this again, but there's a tension that kind of comes with people because we're not always at our best. Matter of fact, our prayer is, is that you were treated in such a way to where you love this place this morning. But there's even a chance that maybe there's some things you didn't like. And although we didn't want that to happen, it may happen because that's just what happens when you deal with people. It's just what happens when you deal with people. And at the end of this parable, Jesus drops this line, this parable about this man. You have a man that was entitled, and you have a man that was grateful. He drops this line. First several times I read it, I thought it was a riddle. I was like, this is a riddle. Like, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's a riddle. And you can find it right here in the book of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 16. Here comes the riddle from Jesus. So the last shall be first, and the first last. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. That, that, that is counterintuitive. How can someone that is last be first and someone that is first be last? It's counterintuitive. Jesus says stuff like this all the time, and it kind of crosses me. He says it's better to give than it is receive. Have you ever tried to convince that to your kids on Christmas morning? It does not work. It, my kids have already learned it. And I'll be like, hey, what's the most important gift? And they're like, Jesus is that. Jesus is the most important gift. And they shred their presence and completely forgot what I said. Um, because it is hard. We are not hardwired to believe that it is better to give than it is received. But once we do it, we find out that he is right. Jesus says stuff like this, you have to lose your life to find it. Makes no sense to me on the surface because why would I need to lose something I've already found to go find something again that I've already found? Why would I want to do that? And you study it and you find out actually what he's meaning is, is that I need to lose my way of life so that I could find his way of life. My way of doing things is actually in the way of his way of doing things. And you find out in that scripture right there, it's counterintuitive. He says that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And here's what he's meaning. He's meaning that anybody who would recognize that although you've got goals, you've got purpose, you've got things you want to pull off in life, but you would recognize that a big part of your purpose is to help other people fulfill theirs, what you have done is, is you have put people in front of you. And you put someone else in front of you. And you put someone else in front of you. And you put someone else in front of you. And in the process of doing that, you will find yourself and you're like, man, it seems like I have, in an attempt to serve Jesus, put myself at the back of the line. And Jesus knew that it would oftentimes feel like that. So he drops this riddle at the end of Matthew, and he says, hey, here's this story, and here's what I want you to know about the person that was grateful and the person that was entitled. The person that was entitled forced themselves to the front, and they're destined to the back. But the person that was grateful, the purpose that served others, the person that laid their purpose down, their goals down in order to help other people, um, they've kind of forced themselves to the back. He said, but I want you to know what I do to people that get in the back and allow other people to be served. He said, I grab them by the hand. He said, and I walk those people that have put themselves in the back, and I walk them right up here to the front. Because just because you have laid something down in order to help people, it may have left your hand, but that does not mean that it left your life. Because what you have done is, is when you have said, I'm going to get busy serving people, and to do so, I've got to let go of some of the things I want to happen potentially. When you let those go, they didn't hit the ground. When you let those go to serve people, they actually landed in God's hands. And your dreams, your calling, your goals, your purpose, your vision, and we ought to have those things, those things are in better hands in his hands than they are when they're in yours hands. So when you're endeavoring to get to the front and you're willing to walk over anybody, Jesus said, hey, you know that person? He's going to find himself in the back. But the person who's willing to serve people and help other people fulfill their purpose, again, it's not a shiny thing. I get it. Matter of fact, even hearing it seems like, it's going to be messy. It's going to be nasty. Why would I want to do that? I'm just going to mind my own business. I'm just going to get mine. Well, you may do that, and you may find yourself at the front. But Jesus has a promise we find in Matthew that the person that takes time to value other people and to prefer them above themselves he didn't promise when it's going to happen, but he says there will be a time. I'm going to grab him by the hand, and the world will look and say, man, it's crazy to build a boat. There's no rain. But then God grabbed Noah by the hand, and he pulled him right up to the front of the line. 
and it started raining. That's what God wants to do with your life if you will allow him to use you to serve people. There's a famous scripture um, that people tie to serving others and serving people, and it's found in the Gospel of John. And uh, we put on the screen, John 15, verse 13. It says, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. If you haven't heard the scripture before, it's, it's a powerful scripture. Greater love is no one this, the one that laid down his life for his friends. So it's been used a lot. So I'm trying to find some new light on this bad boy. So I'm studying it really heavy. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to find out what lay down really means. What does it really mean to lay down my life? What does it really mean? So I look in the original translations and I'm looking in Hebrew and I'm looking at Greek and I'm getting all these definitions. And I finally got, it. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to show these. I'm going to let them this morning. We're going to find out what lay down actually means. And I found out that what lay down actually means is simply to place oneself horizontally. Or in other words, lay down means lay down. Um, and that's, that's just what it means. It is when I lay down my life, it just means that I'm about to lay it down. That's, that's what I'm going to do. There's nothing else there. Don't waste your time. I wasted mine. You don't have to. Um, uh, it just means to lay down. And then when I think about I'm laying down my life, kind of sounds heroic, but the other side of it kind of seems a little nasty to me a little bit because I'm like, man, when I lay my life down, people are going to use me as a doormat. Because I feel like that sometimes. Like if I'm willing to constantly be at the back, here I am. I'm at the back of the again. I got to, you see me back here in the back. I'm, I'm serving others. I'm doing this. And they're cranky. They're mean. I'm loving them. I want to, but I don't. And you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and all these things. And you have these, the real feelings that people have. And if you haven't had them yet, you'll have them before too long. Just stay down here. Keep breathing. It's going to happen. Um, uh, and you're like, man, I, I'm tired of just pushing my way to the back. I'm pushing. And here's the deal. What you understand is this, is that when you're laying your life down, it does not mean that you're laying your life as a doormat. It means that you are laying your life down as a bridge in hopes that someone who is far from God would have an access point that they can utilize to get to him. God wants to use your life when you lay it down in service of other people. And I don't mean just in a humanitarian effort, but I mean in the sense to where you are trying to draw them closer to God's sweet son, Jesus Christ. You are laying down your life. You are using it as a bridge for him to use. And now you lay it down. And I know that that can create some tension because when am I a doormat? When am I a bridge? I, get, I feel the tension even saying it. I almost didn't say it. Like I, I get that because when am I this? When am I that? And there is a character in the Bible. His name's Peter. And Peter is famous for denying Jesus three times. There's another character in the Bible. His name is Judas, and Judas is famous for betraying Jesus and turning him over to the Romans. You've got Peter, and you've got Judas. Peter denied Jesus three times, had a bad day, went ahead and kept serving Jesus. You've got Judas that turned him over to be crucified, had a bad heart. So there are people that may have had a bad day. You can't just throw them out of your life just because they had a bad day. But there are people that have a bad heart. And there are people that need to be restored, but there are other people that need to be released. And even saying that, you're like, well, how in the world do I know the difference between the two? Here's what I find out as humans. We've got two plays that we run all the time when it comes to how we deal with people. We've got two plays in our playbook, and you think we'd have more, but we have two. Play number one is we just let everyone real close. Come on in. We met yesterday. Here's my social security number. You know what I'm saying? Here's my passwords. Here's this. Come on in. You want to be my friend? Oh, I'm, I'm friends. I'm starving for a new friend. Come on in. I don't, I don't need to know anything about you. Um, you're, you're a mass murderer. No big deal. Come on in. You're my friend. And we just let them Oh, come give me a hug. Yeah, yeah. come on, come on. Or be gone. And we don't know how to live in between the balance of the two. And sometimes that's what makes it hard for us to determine the role that someone's supposed to play in our life because we've only got two, play, two plays. Come to Thanksgiving dinner or I never want to see you again. And I want to present something practical, but there is another play that you actually may have used already online, and that play is called Snooze. Have you ever snoozed anybody? It's one of the most refreshing things you can do. They don't even know it. You know what I'm saying? Like, they'd have no idea. And you, I mean, when I, I feel empowered when I snooze somebody. Like, I hit that, I'm like, I feel strong. You cannot show up for 30 days. Like, and all I had to do is push this button. You won't be here anymore. You can snooze people, not just online, not just on social media, but in real life. You can actually create distance that makes it to where there are people don't have so much access to you to where they can't just ruin your life. But you also don't have to throw them away just because they did something you didn't like one time just because they had a bad day. Peter had a bad day. Judas had a bad heart. And there's a difference between the two. And when it comes to fulfilling our purpose, we're going to have to be prayerful. We're going to have to stay in the word. We're going to have to be worshipful to make sure that we stay in tune with what role is this person supposed to play. But ideally, what we know is, is that we're supposed to be a bridge. And if they've been on that bridge so long, 
if they're clogging up the traffic, it's time to snooze them. Or if they've been on that bridge so long that in their own mind it's become a doormat or you feel that same way, it's time to snooze them. But if they're on that bridge and they're asking the right questions, they've got the right heart, they're not perfect, but you can see that God is using you as a bridge to get them closer to him, it's time to restore, it's time to rebuild, it's time to love, it's time to understand that God has a plan for them and God has a plan for you. There's another scripture in the Bible that uh, you, I don't think you can get up here and say that you don't like scriptures. I don't think I should do that, um, uh, but uh, I don't like it as much. How about that? I can say that. I don't like it as much, um, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. And I love the Word of God, but the ones that challenge me in unique ways that my predisposition is to be the opposite, those aren't my favorite, and that's okay. Um, it's not my favorite, but you can find it in 2 Corinthians. It says, we are like common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure within so that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's and not ours. We are like common clay jars. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the universes, the stars, the moon, the sun, the trees, the waters, the 200-inch white-tailed deer. Like God created all of these beautiful things, and he put them down here. And you're like, man, look what he did. And he went to create man, and he grabbed a handful of dirt. And I'm like bro, like, look at all these other things. And he wanted to create Adam, and he grabbed dirt. And the Corinthians lets us know that we're no different. We are common clay jars. But then it gives a caveat. He said, what we carry is what makes us unique. We carry the glorious treasure within so that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's and not ours. Here's what I think is unique when it comes to people being tied to our purpose is it I would like to believe God to fix this, work here, and do this. Just the general categories. Boom, boom, boom. And my initial expectation is that there would be an angel UPS drop it off on my front door so that I could pick this one up on Monday, this one up on Tuesday, and this one up on Wednesday, and then I would come up with new things that I needed the angel UPS to drop off at my door. But when we pray for God to do miracles, oftentimes the miracle shows up as a common clay jar. And the way we treat the clay jar determines on whether or not the treasure, the glorious treasure that's been hidden within, shows up. We pray for God to work big, and he sends a Bill, and he sends a Susie. And then Bill and Susie show up. And then now the way I handle Bill, the way I treat Susie, determine whether or not the answer for my purpose that God has hidden them, whether or not it ever shows up. See, the way we honor people determines whether or not it shows up. You've got Jesus who is a baller. He is raising the dead. He is opening up blind eyes. He's healing the lame. Like, it's going his way, guys. Prophets have done it before, but not to this frequency. And he's dumb. Like, he, and they're like, oh my gosh, Jesus, Jesus, look, what can he not do and he gets to his hometown, and scripture is really clear. It says he couldn't do any great work because of the way they received him. And if Jesus couldn't do anything great for people when they didn't receive him properly, how much more should we be willing to look past the common clay and look for the treasure, mine for the gold that God has put in the people that he has put in our life? And when we mine for the gold, what we'll find out is that there is gold there, there is treasure there. You say, why in the world will God use common clay to get a treasure in my life? Because God uses you and your common clay. But what makes you extraordinary is the treasure that he has hid on the inside of you. And oftentimes, people will rub us wrong so we don't get what we're supposed to get from them. Matter of fact, we may have more negative experiences in church then we've got positive ones. And there's a common theme that you'll hear. I would go to church if it wasn't for the people. And in my personal opinion, I want to present this fact to you. I don't think Jesus Christ has any intentions of coming in here, nor any desire or any want to come in and make church perfect. He don't want to do it. Not only are there always going to be people at different levels of growth, but God uses people to disciple and to help People. He doesn't want this place perfect. He wants it a little messy. He knows that he made us out of dirt. He knows that we're common clay. He recognizes that there are going to be some things that happen that maybe we're less fortunate, but our job is to allow him to work on the things we don't like and the things we do like. When we trust him, we give him access to all of our experiences so that we don't just use the ones or trust him with the ones that went the way we wanted them to go. I'm 14 years old, and my youth pastor asked me to preach my first sermon, and I'm psyched. I'm like, I got, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to do this. 
And he says, keep it to five to seven minutes. I said, I can do that. That's no problem. I didn't know anything anyways. Like, it was going to be a stretch to hit five minutes. And I was like, what am I going to preach? What am I going to preach? And I'm processing through my options. And I thought, you know what? We're pretty mean to this guy. Like, we're not very nice to him. Uh, we, he had a Ford Ranger, and several of us turned it in between two other cars. Um, and uh, we, he was stuck at church overnight. Um, uh, because he couldn't get out. And I was like, man, we're, we're not nice. We don't honor him. We don't respect him. We don't do anything. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to preach on honor. So I get up there, and I didn't know anything about it, really, other than what my parents made me do. Um, uh, and uh, so I get there, and I'm like, listen, guys, he's our spiritual leader. He's our pastor. God sent him to be a blessing to us. We should honor him. We need to quit acting like this. We need to quit doing that. We need to straighten up. We need to honor this guy. We, we need to honor him. And that's probably, how long did that take? Anyway, that was my sermon. That's my whole sermon right there. That's what I said. And uh, so I sat down and I'm like, I preached on honor. He's going to ask me back up next week. No chance he doesn't. This guy wants me back up there because I, I, I helped him out. I hooked him up. I'm an asset to him now. He knows. I get it. Um, uh, and he gets up there and he's like, hey, guys. He's like, Ryan. Man, you did all right. And for me personally, um, you might as well say I did the worst job in the world. Like, that's the most horrible thing I've ever heard in my life if you're going to tell me I did all right. I can't stand the word, to be honest with you. Like, I would rather you just say that was, that was a piece of trash. That's the worst thing you've ever done in your life than say all right. I just don't like it. I'm a words affirmation guy. Like, I like to hear some positive feedback. And when I hear some positive feedback, that just does me good. I saw someone just smile. The sermon just got five minutes longer. I mean, that's all it takes for me. You know what I'm saying? That's 20, 30. You know what I'm saying? That's all it takes for me to feel. I, when I feel that, man, I get going. I feel like I'm doing good. And he got up there. He said, Ryan, you did all right. And I was like, ugh, that's disgusting. And then he goes and he says this. And listen, guys, listen, we're boys. Y'all don't have to respect me. And I feel like I cut my feet out. I didn't trust him. And the same day I started preaching, I quit. Very same day. I was like, I'm done. I'm over it. I'm done. Two or three days later, hanging out with my buddies. And my wife, Haley, her uncle, we run into him. Just like I think it was at a fuel station. We just run into him. And he said, Ryan, I heard that you preached for your first time. I was like, man, I do not want to talk about it. I did, but I don't even want to talk about it. He said, no, tell me about it. So I told him about the experience and everything like that. And I'm expecting him to have my back and be like, let's go get the dude, that punk. How dare him? You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, that's what I'm expecting. I'm ready to go. I'm like, yeah, let's go talk trash. And, uh, and he looks at my buddy. He starts talking to my buddy. I'm like, well, bro, you just asked me. Why are you talking to him? You just asked, this is about me right now. Why are you talking to my buddy? And he looks at my buddy and he says, buddy, um, uh, he didn't do that, but he said, he's called him by name. He said, would you get up there and preach? He's like, there's no way. He was like, are you kidding me? He was like, there's a thousand things I would do before I got up there and preached. And at the same time, he turned around and he looked at me. He said, Ryan, I think what's happening here is that you are using how something went to be the qualifier on whether or not you were supposed to do it. And I think the enemy has us potentially as a whole as Christ followers, as humans, been on the fact that we determined whether or not it went the way we wanted it to to determine whether or not we were supposed to do it. We allow how it felt, how people responded, to determine whether or not that's what we were supposed to do. And really, the qualifier should simply be other people weren't built to do it. Other people couldn't have done it. Other people wanted to run from it. And you got up there and you did it. You chased it. You tried it. And again, if you miss a thousand layups in the row, you're not supposed to go to the NBA. There's some things that are just obvious. You know what I'm saying? It, it, but eventually, if it's a call of God, you can't allow that to be the qualifier, but eventually the tide will turn. You say, well, how is the tide from turn? Do you know what he told us? He said, listen, I'm going to grab you from the back and over a process of time, of you trusting me with your life and purpose, I'm going to pull you to the front. You cannot let seems to be be the governing belief and compass in your life to determine whether or not that's what God has for you or not. You've got to open up the areas of the things that didn't go the way you wanted them to and give him room to still work there. I was going to a church camp, and I was ready to go because I heard there's a bunch of girls there, and I was like, it's on. And I'm sitting in the auditorium of the church, and I've got my ball cap on because I'm going to church camp. Old dude comes up behind me, reaches back, slaps me in the back of the head, and knocks my hat right off my head. And I'm confused, and it hurt. And I'm like, I'm fixing to look around, and there's going to be some people that are demanding justification. Vindication. It's going to happen. Someone is going to come to my aid. They had to see that sucker slap this hat 
off the back of my head, and I look around, and they all look just as condemning at me as he did. And I asked some questions afterwards, and I was like, they was like, you can't wear a hat in the presence of God. And I didn't, wasn't witty enough then to say it, but I can say it right now. God was nowhere close to that place. He was nowhere around. Like he was, you couldn't find him. You could, he, he wasn't there because they had made priorities. Like you couldn't, I almost wore one today, but when I fixed my hair, it was looking kind of nice, so I just left it alone. But I'm just saying, they had made priorities and established categories that God never established. They made things important that God never made important. I'm sitting there and I'm taking up offering in church for the first time. And I'm like, I don't mean from, I'm not talking. I just, they gave a little bag with two wooden handles on it. And you're standing up front for everybody to stare at you. And the way we used to do it is they would pray and everybody would walk down. They'd put their money in the bag. And I'm sitting there thinking, I bet you, I bet you I get more money in this bag than anybody else. I'm like, it's gonna, I'm gonna smile at these people and I'm, I'm gonna get all this money. And about the time the pastor says, amen, from his offering prayer, the youth pastor's running from the back. And I'm like, oh my goodness, he's about to drop a check in this bag. Like they're gonna let me do this every week. He's gonna tie, pastor gonna tie for the first time. He got convicted, saw me holding this bucket. He wanted to cover this bag. He's gonna put the check in there. And he runs up and I'm like, here it goes. And he reaches and I'm like, what's going on? He grabs the bag, rips it out of my hand and pushes me over to the front pew. Like, what in the world is going on, dude? And I sized him up. I came to the conclusion that I could not whoop him, so I left him alone. But I did, you know what I'm saying? But I did recognize, what's going on? And the pastor comes up afterwards, and he tried to explain to me the importance, the importance, guys, of not wearing shorts when you took up the offering. And I was like, bro, it's July. Like, it's, it's July, dude. Are you kidding me? Y'all didn't call me ahead of time. You gave me no heads up. You asked me to do it. The guy that asked me to do it was not blind. He saw I had shorts on. And I'm what I'm saying is they... We at this church get rid of the categories that limit people from finding their purpose. We get rid of them. You want to wear a hat? Do it. You want to be dripping in a three-piece? Rock the thing. If you want to wear shorts at church, nobody, I mean, do your thing. You know, check with your hands and everything like that. But after that, wear the shorts. Bring them on in. Let it be what it is. And it's not because, it's not because we're, just, we're just so lax on things. No, it is. It's because what we're intentional about is that we know God loves people as they are, and we want to create an atmosphere where they can come in, hat like this, hat like this, no hat, three-piece suit, coat, short, don't care. Come in and find God. Find him for real. Find him where he's at. And you know what? And I've noticed that I, it took me some time, but I forgave those people. The guy that embarrassed me in front of the church, the guy that slapped me up in the back of the head, I don't wish them any ill. I actually wouldn't mind the guy that hit me in the back of the head. Something could happen to him. But you know what I'm saying? Like That's kind of where I'm at right now. And I noticed that the things that made me never want to serve God again, and I'm just being honest with you, had nothing to do with God, had everything to do with people that were ridiculous. Those things, when I took the time to give God access over here, not just over here, not just in the good, in the bad, it created a conviction in my life to make sure that I would use all the energy I have so that no one else ever felt like that again in their attempt to find Jesus. And I think God wants to do the same thing this morning in your life is he wants to use the things that were less fortunate, use the things that you didn't like. And if you allow him to, put them in his hand, he'll turn them and he'll make them happen. We let people bring coffee in the church. We let them bring water in the church. People say, why do you do that? And the simple answer is people get thirsty. <laughs> Did y'all know that? People get thirsty. And sometimes I might feel like preaching a little long and it helps me with my conviction. If y'all know you've got something to drink, I don't feel as bad about being long-winded. You let people have snacks in church. Oh my goodness. Oh my... Fact number two, people get hungry. They get hungry, and we're not going to try to seem better than we are in some fake facade of an attempt to look to God and say, the creator of the universe who made you need drink, who made you need potato chips, he made you that way, and look at him and say, hey, right now we're going to short circuit our design in some fake attempt to be reverent to you, and in the process, lose people. We're not going to do it around here. It's just not going to happen, and maybe there's some things that have happened in your life that God wants to turn so you can be that same way and say, on my watch, that's not going to happen. I am a bridge that brings people closer to Jesus. And the qualifier on whether or not God wants to give me purpose and do something in my life is not that it went the way I wanted it to, because here's what I want you to understand. I would have never got that piece of information from my wife's uncle, which is it doesn't have to go the way you wanted it to, to be what God wanted you to do. I would have never got that if the first guy wasn't a jerk. And we don't like that. It's a tension. And I, I could feel it but if the first guy wasn't a jerk, I wouldn't have got that. And that's carried me through several times. 
It's carried me through several times where I would have potentially gave up on it being God because it didn't look the way I thought God would do something. But he gave me something at 14 that he couldn't have gave me unless something first happened that I didn't like. I was at a church in Tulsa for about eight years of my life. And I was at that church, and it was a beautiful place. It was a, it was a great place. I love the place to this day. Um, God did some amazing things there in my life. And I'd been there a couple years and God began to talk to me about serving in the church. And I want to put a qualifier out there. I was actually in ministry before, so I didn't need the Holy Spirit to speak to me about serving in church. I knew that you should do that. But I reminded him when he brought that up that the reason he sent me to the bigger church in Tulsa was so I can sneak in and sneak out and be unseen. So why in the world would I change my plans and serve? Because then people are going to know my name. And a couple months later, he said, you know what? I think it's time for you to serve. I was like, okay. I can serve, I can serve people, I can do it. And I went and I got that packet and I looked at it and to be transparent, I threw it away. And that happened two more times. Three times, a guy that had previously been vocationally in the ministry couldn't work up the nerve to serve because I had closed off, got access to things that I wish wouldn't have happened and I have tied his hands and his ability to use those to get me closer to my purpose. So I do that three times, and I'm not feeling good about it. And then my wife, Haley, and I were sitting there in this worship service and experience, and we're worshiping. And I don't mean in an audible voice. I don't mean God parted the clouds, but I, do, I did feel it. I, did, I knew it. Like, I was convicted by it. God said this to me, the Holy Spirit. Again, I don't mean an audible voice. I just knew it in my heart. He said, pray for your wife. And I was like, God, I don't know if you know this, but your boy's single. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm single. I'm not married, so there's no wife to pray for because um, uh, I'm, I'm single. And I'm enjoying the song, and I'm worshiping, and I'm singing something, and, uh, I don't, but I'm singing. And again, the same thing, pray for your wife. And I'm like, God, I know you got your stuff together up there, but uh, there's some information, short change, like something's wrong. Your boy's single, ready to mingle, but I'm, I'm single. Like, you just let me know. Where is she at? Like, I mean, if that's what's going on, where is she at? And I looked to my right, and you shouldn't have took this, but there's my wife. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I get it. Pray for my wife. So I begin to pray. And uh, God didn't make Haley say yes. You know what I'm saying? I, I made some adjustments. I put some cologne on. I started making some moves. You know what I'm saying? Like, I did my thing and it worked. Um, uh, so we get married. And then God brings up this serving thing again. And I'm like, God, don't you know I threw it away three times? But he brings up the serving thing. So I said, all right. Uh, I talked to Haley. I said, babe, what do you think? She's like, let's do it. I was like, all right. Grabbed the packet a fourth time, filled it out, turned it in before I left. And I left. I handed the lady. She was smiling so big, man. Like She was sent from God. She was like, you are going to do so great. And she didn't know me, and I know she was just saying it because that's what she said. But in that moment, it did not matter. I felt like it's the first time she ever told anybody they were going to do a good job serving Jesus. That's what I felt. She made me feel that way. I know it's not true, but it didn't matter in that moment. I looked at my wife, and she was tearing up, and I was tearing up. And you're like, man, why would you be tearing up just to serve? It had no, it, it, You're just looking at the surface. We were signing back up for our purpose. We were realigning our lives with the plan of God. And it had been some time since we had done it. So we start serving in the youth ministry. And I had done that before, so I'm like, I can get out, I can dig this. And we're serving the youth ministry, we're having a good time, and we're doing this. And then they asked me, they're like, hey, man, uh, won't you... Won't you preach a couple of times? So I'm preaching a couple of times. And after that, I found out that the youth pastor, he was moving and they were going to hire a new youth pastor. And I was looking at my wife and I was like, could this be? You know, I'm like, could, this might be for us. And she was like, man, it might be, it might not be. And I'm over here, I'm thinking, you know what? We're going to apply. And if you knew the insecurity I had before we could send in a written resume via Facebook Messenger, what it took to hit send because of the areas of my life I have not allowed God to work on that he could use to fulfill. I mean, it was like that button weighed 10 million pounds and I finally clicked it. I was like, who can't bring it back? We sent it. God, if you're in it, do it. Ooh, God, if you're in it, do it. Radio silence for eight weeks. We're on a Wednesday night doing our thing. Come in there. Pastor's wife gets up there. Great woman. Instrumental in me and my wife's life. Looked up there so much. Still do. She calls a guy to the front. They hired somebody else. And I was like, 
I mean, because like, I wouldn't say for sure that God wanted, but I thought, y'all feel me? Like I thought, like I was, like it took so much just to apply. That had to be God, right? Like, I mean, because it, because of what it took. So, I mean, what it, what it cost. So God had to be in that. I remember sitting there and I'm trying to muster up some excitement for this dude because he's a solid dude and I knew he would do a good job. And I'm faking the mess out of it. And I give him a hug and like I held him extra long. I made myself do it. I was like, no, man, you're not going to take an L right now, Ryan. You are not going to take an L right now, Ryan. A little bit after that, we were praying about what we were supposed to do with our life. And I run in to an old friend. By old friend, I don't mean that we had lost contact. I just mean we'd been a friend for a long time. And I'm explaining to him what I just told you. And he said, you know what? Is God potentially saying it's time to come to Muskogee? It was our lead pastor, Jared Callahan. It wasn't the first time he asked me the question. He'd asked me that question for three years. And me and my wife prayed about it. And we weren't bitter. We weren't mad. Those people were good to us. They're still good to us. We love them. And then we decided that it was time, not knowing what would take place, to move our family back to the town we were from, back to the town we lived in, back to the town where we did life. So we moved back to Muskogee. And what I didn't know then that I know now was that God wanted to use my wife to be the Life Kids pastor here at the brick. God wanted to use this place to give my family hope again. God wanted to use this place to give me a shot at doing what I thought he created me to do again. God wanted to use this place to do all of the things that I was hoping I would find in the other place. And the way he got me here is something I did not want to happen led me to what he wanted to happen. Something I did not want that felt like the opposite of him in the time was the catapult, the slingshot, the ramp he used to propel me into what he wanted the whole time. And my challenge to you this morning is this, is do not shut the door on the things that don't seem like him. Do not shut the door on the things you would rewrite the script if you got to. Do not forget that God still wants to use the messy and the unfortunate And that may be the very thing right now he's waiting on you to surrender to him for him to get you to the next place that he wants you to do. You're saying, man, I just feel like I've been in the back for a while. While you're back here, turn loose one more thing. And you don't have to do it all at once, but you can do it. Turn loose one more thing. Look in that seat back in front of you and look at that calm card and say, you know what? I've thrown it away. I've overlooked it. I've ignored it when they said it from the stage, but it's time to start serving people and I've got the opportunity. Check the box on that bad boy and put it in the bucket when it passes. And if you can't check it today, look at it, point at it, say, I'm coming for you, buddy, because a day is coming where he is bringing me from the back, back to the front and I am going to serve people with my life. I'm not going to let my experiences keep me. They're going to catapult me. I trust God so much that he can use the bad just like he can use the good. And I believe if you'll do that, purpose will start happening. You'll start feeling it, knowing it, seeing it. I believe he'll multiply your efforts when you surrender other parts of your life to him. Thanks for joining us for today's message. And our prayer is that God use that message to get exactly what he needed for you today. If you're still joining us, you may be looking for a way to join the community. We'd love for you to comment, share, send us a message, help us connect with you because we want you to feel like you're a part of the family here at The Brick. If you're looking for a way to give back, you can text the word BRICK to 45888. That's the word BRICK to 45888. The first time you do that, it's going to connect you to a credit card, debit card, or bank account. We just want to say thank you for being a part of leading people to become fully devoted followers of Christ.